Okay, welcome to the next section of Ubiquitous Computing. Now today we are going to see more about uh, what Ubiquitous Computing is or what the aims of Ubiquitous Computing uh, are. And we'll start with repeating what Mark Weiser at the time said about Ubiquitous Computing because he is the one that coins this phrase. So there are three ways you could answer when somebody is asking you what is Ubiquitous Computing exactly. And the first we've already seen. The first one is, Ubiquitous Computing is a new type of computing paradigm, where in the first phase people had uh, a mainframe computer and you would have multiple people using one particular computer. And those, you know, rise in, in, uh, or have risen, risen in the 60s, computers were the size of a big room and people had to queue in order to be using, you know, in, order, in order to be able to use those particular computers. Um, However, a little bit later, as computer technology advanced, uh, PCs arrived. And this was the second era of computing, according to Weiser. Here you had one person having one computer, usually at their work, if they were using it a lot for work, and sometimes also at their homes. This computer had a particular desk, people had to go to this desk, switch on the computer, wait a while, and then they could use their computer. Uh, but only this computer would be for them and them themselves. So one user, one computer. Now these were the two first phases, and Mark Weiser predicted that there soon would be a third phase, where computers will be more plentiful, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger, but the real difference here would be that one user would be able to use multiple, dozens of computers. And if this is the case, if computers are suddenly everywhere and people in their daily lives can interact with any computer they see or with many computers they see, then one requirement would be this invisibility that he talked about. And the invisibility is not about the size of the computer or the fact that somebody could be hiding this computer away, but it's really about how cognitive present, cognitively present people should be when they use these type of computers. So even a mainframe could still be invisible if people could just walk by and use that mainframe on a whim, you know, as if they would uh, use um, a, a telephone or uh, a bicycle or some other type of technology that they're really used to. So this is really the invisibility that he was talking about. But, and that's the point of the slides, Ubiquitous computing is this third era of computing. Okay. This invisibility is the second way, or you could describe ubiquitous computing. It is an aim for computer science as a whole. And he says this invisibility is very important because this is a way to create technology that is able to uh, allow you to perform a task in a better way. Because invisibility or invisible technology stays out of the way of the task. He gives there are several examples, like a pencil. If you're writing with a pencil, you're usually thinking about the words you're about to write or the sentence that you have in your mind. It's not about how you hold your pencil. Um, it's not about how to use this particular pencil. This technology is known to you and you use it without thinking about it. The same for a car. If you're driving around with your car, you usually are not thinking about which buttons to press uh, for those things that you use a lot, you know, how to use the steering wheel, how to shift gears, all these things you usually just do without thinking about. You often think, or you should be thinking about how you're driving on the streets, who to avoid that also is using the streets, um, where to drive to. These are your primary tasks, not the technology that you're using. If this goes wrong, if this technology somehow changes, like if your, if your pencil suddenly breaks off uh, or becomes dull, you start thinking about this technology. Same for a car. This car starts rattling, you start thinking about this car. And that kind of diverts your attention away from the task that you are doing or you should be doing. You're not thinking about anymore about what, what you're writing. You're not thinking about uh, where you're driving to, but you're thinking more about the technology. And that makes you not as efficient and not as concentrated on the task anymore. And this is bad. This is something that computing should definitely not be. And at the time, in the 90s, and I would say still now, uh, decades later, 
this is still not the case. If we use a computer, often there are windows popping up, often our uh, attention is diverted by other things. We're not always thinking about the task that we want to perform with our computer. It's usually very hard um, to, to divert his attention away from using the computer itself. And most computers, even nowadays, but in the 90s, definitely would dominate the interaction with them. At the time, many computers were still using a command line where you would have to constantly think what command you had to type to perform a certain task. And only after several tries, you usually would get this right. Sometimes you could make critical mistakes. And even if you would have a graphical user interface, it would not be as intuitive and nice as you might think. And even nowadays, where all of us are using graphical user interfaces, there are often loads of instances where we're constantly thinking about how to do things and not about what we're doing. And this is what your biggest computing is about. It's about making those computers invisible, invisible in this way. So we should make computers that are so easy to use that you're not thinking about how to use that computer anymore. And this as a goal, I think, is still as um, present as it was in the 90s. Now, here are a couple of examples that Mark Weiser has mentioned in his slides in the 90s uh, of what is wrong with uh, current with computer science at the time in the 90s. Now, one of the things that at the time I was using that was uh, being hyped were graphical user interfaces that were extremely nice to look at. Some of them would be 3D. You would have desktops that you could change in from one to another. The thing would, hold, would rotate. It would have some wow effects of things that would move around everywhere. And those would be really entertaining, but those would divert your attention away from what you were going to do. Often they would take longer, and often they would make using that computer slower or not as efficient or not as intuitive as it should be. Now, this is definitely wrong in Marx Weiser's eyes. He said, this might be entertainment, it might be dramatic, but it's definitely a wrong way to use a computer. And this is definitely not what Ubiquitous Computing should be about. The same, he said, for computers magically meeting our desires. At that time in the 90s, there was a big drive in user agents. We'll see a bit more in the next lecture about that. And at the time, you would have websites the first websites popping up in this regard, but also programs that try to interact with a person as if they were a person trying to help you. And that he was also against. He said this is nice as a, a, a basic practice, but it's assuming that these computers can understand everything that a user would want and that what the user would want could be articulated. And this is extremely hard to do for most computers. The tacit, that is that the things that are really hard to describe, the context in which a user is perhaps giving a certain command is very hard to grasp for computers in the 90s, just as it is now decades later. So also that is something that is definitely not the core of Ubiquitous computing. So when you talk about a computer as an assistant, as something that is helping you, um, he definitely rails against that. So the fact that you have an anthropomorphic um, idealization of a computer, a computer that is acting like a servant, like a butler, is definitely something that should not be the way um, a computer should be used in his mind. Um, it insults the human assistants that are capable of much more, more back then and still now. And it could also misplace trust. Finally, another thing that uh, at the time in the 90s were, was as big as it is now again is virtual reality, where you, for instance, put on glasses and suddenly the world as it is could be represented in a digital fashion. So everything is digitized and you as a human can move around in this virtual way just as if you would move around in the, in the analog world. Now, this was wrong. Uh, for a computer in general, for uh, Warkweiser, because this reduces the human to just sensing what is going on, what is being streamed into your eyes, and perhaps other senses, your ears, your skin, um, if you have vibrotactile elements, perhaps. Um, but Ubicomp, in his regard, is completely the opposite. You try to put the computer into the world, 
into a distributed fashion. So computers are part of the real world, but you don't try to map the real world, digitize it, and then put it into a virtual reality that is parallel to this, uh, to this model. So also that is not what ubiquitous computing is about. It is about other things, and some of those, I said already last time, are about how humans act socially, psychologically, and we will see lots of things um, such as, for instance, this is just one, one of the many previews I could give, but affordance is one of those things that becomes very important. Now, affordance, some of you might already know because you have a human-computer interaction background, or you might have seen this in another course, but affordance originally was introduced by psychologists as a way to describe the possible actions that a person could take in a certain environment. Regardless of whether those uh, were perceivable or not, it's just about the possible actions that you could have. Now, this was much later, so this was something that uh, was introduced in the 70s, but uh, uh, much later in the late 80s, um, Don Norman introduced in his um, Psychology of Everyday Things exactly this term, affordance, and gave it a little twist by saying these are the things that people can perceive and things that suggest how an object can be used. Even though you might never have used this object before, by just looking at it, by just perceiving this object, you immediately know how it is being used. A good example there, for instance, are doorknobs or um, the, the handles to open windows. So if you look now in your room, I hope it has a window, I hope it definitely has a door, you will look at that and then immediately know how to use this, even though you might never have used this window handle or this door handle. You know that you have to grasp it in a certain way, you have to turn it in a certain way perhaps, and then you have to pull it in a certain way just by looking at it. Some of them might be um, uh, knobs that you have to turn, some of them might be handles that you have to turn, but the way they look gives already a hint on how you should use those. And exactly that is what affordance is all about. If you can use affordance uh, for particular embedded systems, for instance, by just looking at a computer, you know how it is being used, then you have something that is probably a very usable uh, system. So this is one way you could improve things in daily life, not just for opening doors or windows, but for using uh, digital computer systems. Now the third way we can think about ubiquitous computing is in a historical and technological way, as a progression from embedded systems. Now embedded systems is a research area that is still ongoing, uh, where people are focusing on having computers, information processing systems, often um, connected with sensors and with actuators that are embedded into a bigger entity, a larger technical product um, that allow controlling this bigger product or using this bigger product. For instance, you could have embedded systems that are embedded into a car, for instance, for deploying um, uh, an airbag. So if the car suddenly crashes or is about to crash, this can be sensed for instance, from an accelerometer, and uh, this goes into a digital system that then makes the decision to deploy the airbag. And many such embedded systems are currently in cars. And like that, we could have multiple computer systems that are embedded in appliances, a washing machine, or in things that uh, originally were not digital, those have become nowadays digital and are, can be seen throughout our lives. Computers are indeed already everywhere. Now, embedded systems was an early denomination for this. Cyber-physical systems is a little bit more recent. In the last decade, this was introduced. And there, the focus is more about uh, computing, computing the computation devices as part of a physical process, where you think about a system that is typically a part uh, multiple of those embedded systems and network together, some of them also with interaction elements, with physical input and output um, as well. And therefore, this is, as we see later, very close to ubiquitous computing's technological goals. Now, to allow all of this, you have not just embedded systems and cyber-physical systems, but also embedded software or embedded software development. Because in the early days, embedded systems were never changed. You know, we 
uh, the, the requirement of putting a new firmware on your washing machine was something that was just not there or very hard to do. Nowadays, this has become a lot easier. Um, and what those devices have often is something that is a general purpose computer almost with particular interfaces. And to allow all of that, you would need embedded software development, which is also, meanwhile, a really big area of research and also used in industry. Now, Mark Weiser at the time said that embedded systems were indeed already there. They were already there for decades. Uh, in his words, microcontrollers were embedded in VCRs. Those were video cassette recorders, for those of you who might not know about that yet. Um, washing machines, cars, etc. However, what Ubiquitous Computing was putting in there that was definitely new is that the interaction was a lot more important or becomes a lot more important, if not the most important thing. And was perhaps even uh, primary versus you know, the fact how you could embed such a device into scaling it down or making it more reliable. That would be perhaps secondary. The networked part was also extremely important for Mark Weiser, as well as the programmable part, as we saw in the last slide. And he talked a lot about things that only now or in the last decade and a half have become more, um, uh, uh, more actual or more, um, more dire, for instance, like the spying of people through their embedded devices or, or devices with embedded systems embedded into them. The unique features for Mark Weiser around Ubiquitous Computing were therefore not really about the technology. The unique features were that you start with social science insights. And he interacted a lot with social scientists and with psychologists. And, and there usually started with the demands for a particular computer system to only then talk to the technologists that he knew very well back there in uh, Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, what he talked uh, and what he then researched about. So the, the driver was really social science and not really computer science or engineering that was uh, booming at the time in the 90s. And the aim, as he uh, constantly stated, was that uh, humans would become very effective at doing something through computers. And this has or it makes uh, a couple more in interesting features that are only or that kind of are unique to Ubiquitous Computing. It is different from comp personal computers. At the time, the personal computer was the computer that everybody knew. Um, he had to argue why you would want to make computers invisible, why people should not think about their computers all the time when they were using a computer. Um, and there he had lots of examples of how uh, Thing, a thing humming uh, on your desk in the office could distract you, um, and how if computers would be so effective that you don't notice that you're using them, well, that would be the real thing to do. At the time, of course, this was possible. And we've already seen this uh, state of flow from psychology. This was possible back then with an even very bare bones PC, but only after a lot of training from that person. One of the things that was uh, very innovative in his vision was that he was talking already very early about computers appearing in different shapes, especially in relation to the displays, that you could have computers that are big and have extremely big displays on which you could interact in certain ways, and that you'd have other computers that were very small and would have also small displays that would be having a, another type of purpose and another type of interaction attached with them. So sometimes, you know, computers, for instance, as small as a post-it note that um, you could just stick on things and would you know, be kind of um, uh, not attached to a certain person. You could just give it to another person. It would just be something very small. But it would be a computer element that could change what it was displaying um, and with which you could interact in certain basic ways, for instance. And displays, in this case, was for his... Um, uh, sake of argument, often something that was visual, but he could uh, also imagine this as something that was uh, auditive, something that he could hear, um, or in some other way. And then finally, something that was also very innovative for the time was that he would say that if you would have these many computers that you would have to interact with in your daily life, then the way you use these computers had to be casual and low intensity. 
You should just be able to meet the computer, use it, and then leave it again. Or bring your computer with you, use it, and then store it away again. Um, and this would have uh, repercussions for many ways of interaction. Uh, you would have to incorporate background attention or shift of attention of the user uh, because of that. Things that at the time were actually not that present yet for general purpose computers. So, to uh, recoup, recoup uh, what I've said, because computing was therefore described as a paradigm sh shift. And this paradigm shift was completely different to what computing paradigms at that time were talking about. So ubiquitous computing was definitely not virtual reality, he was saying, was definitely not artificial intelligence, and was definitely not user agents. Now we'll see in the next session what those three are and how he describes ubiquitous computing was something completely different from those things. So I'll see you next time for the next session.